So today's video is going to be another solved true crime case. Today we're going to South Africa and I don't think I've ever done a South African case before. If I have, it was a really long time ago. So today we're gonna to be talking about the Sizzlers massacre. But before we get into it, I just wanna thank our sponsors for making this video possible, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of classes in a range of different subjects from productivity, business, to lifestyle kind of stuff, cooking, decorating, all the way to like creativity, photography, video editing. I use Skillshare in so many different areas of my life. I've used it for self-care purposes in the past. I've learned how to journal using Skillshare. I used it when I first moved to my new apartment. I used it to help me with my interior decorating. And one of the biggest things that I use Skillshare classes for is for my work. The latest Skillshare class that I've taken is called Productivity Today, Managing Attention in the Digital Age by Kevin Siska. In this day and age, you can't argue that our biggest distraction, our biggest factor that affects our productivity is technology. It's phones, laptops, social media. I'm guilty of it myself. I mean, I sometimes I go on Twitter when I should be doing true crime research. But this class gives you so many different techniques to get rid of those distractions and focus on what really matters. It helps you to track how much time you actually spend distracted from your work. This class gives you so many different techniques to get rid of all of those distractions around you. Different softwares that you can use to hide your notifications, different like, so many different techniques. It's been a godsend for me. I genuinely think that there's nothing better to do right now with the state of the world as it is than to work on yourself, get a new hobby, work on a new skill, enrich yourself. It gives us something to do while we're all bored at home. And it also, once we get back out into the world, it'll make you a more interesting person. You'll have more things to talk about when we can finally socialize again. And I think Skillshare is a great way to do all of those things. Literally, I use it so much. And Skillshare are kind enough to be offering the first 1000 of you guys to click the link down below in the description 30% off of an annual premium membership. This offer even works if you've already had your free trial of Skillshare. You can still use this discount, so go for it. Go click the link in the description. Thanks again to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Now let's get into it. Before we do get into it, I just wanna give you a quick content warning that this case does involve a hate crime against the LGBTQ plus community. So if that is something that you don't wanna see right now, feel free to click out of this video. I won't be offended, I'm sure. I'll see you again sometime with a case that's a little bit more appropriate for you. Look after yourself. Hopefully I'll see you again soon. But with that being said, let's just get into the case. So this case takes place in Cape Town in South Africa in 2003, particularly a rather affluent coastal suburb named Sea Point. Sea Point is physically, like aesthetically, a very beautiful place to live. As I'm sure you can tell from the name, it's right on the coast. It's got beautiful views. However, it does have quite an issue with crime, or at least it did in the 2000s. I'm not entirely sure what it's like right now, but at the time in 2003, there were a lot of problems with gangs. There were a lot of problems with drugs, illegal sex work. Even murders weren't even all that uncommon in Sea Point. They often tended to be related to the drug problems and the gang problems, but during the day it was an okay place, but as soon as it got dark, that's when all of these things started coming out. It wasn't really safe for you to be out on the street alone at night. And on January 20th, 2003, the city was about to see its worst massacre in Cape Town's history. In the early hours of the morning, a cashier at a gas station in Seapoint was alerted to a young man stumbling through the front door covered in blood. It was very clear that this man had been brutally attacked. He was bleeding profusely from the head, from his throat. His face was a mess. There were cuts and swelling grazers all over his face. He even had a piece of tape dangling down from the side of his cheek as if maybe his mouth had been taped up. The bleeding from his head and his throat were later found to be from a gunshot wound and his throat had also been slashed. On top of that, his jaw was almost completely out of place. It was like slanting to the side. It was slightly shattered. His mouth was full of blood. He was speaking, but it was hard to kind of make out what he was saying because like I say, he barely had a jaw. It was a miracle that this man was even still standing. It seemed as though he had been brutalized. And the cashier was really struggling to make out what this man was trying to say, obviously partly due to his injuries, the fact his mouth was full of blood. He wasn't 
making too much sense. But also because the cashier was just horrified. I mean, this was like something out of a horror movie. This guy has just walked in here. He's very clearly been savagely attacked. The cashier was terrified. So they could barely calm down for a second to even listen to this guy and try and make out what he was saying. The injured man ended up collapsing in the doorway of the store and the cashier ran over to try and listen to what he was saying. And all he could say was, I don't wanna die. And the cashier also made out the odd couple of words he heard police and seven Graham Avenue. So immediately the cashier ran to the phone, called the police and told them to go to seven Graham Avenue. Of course, he also mentioned that he's got this guy in his store and so police and ambulances were now running to there where they were at the gas station and also seven Graham Avenue. So police raced to this address that the man gave and there they found a place called Sizzlers, which was a male massage parlor. I think it was actually more like an escort agency for young gay men. It was kind of like a brothel type situation. Their client base tended to be older, richer, often closeted and sometimes even married men that would come to this massage parlor to solicit sex from these young gay men. But tonight wasn't business as any other night in Sizzlers because as soon as police walked through that front door, they found an absolute bloodbath. There was blood everywhere, all over the walls, all over the floors, literal like pools of blood on the floors. There was so much, it was on the ceilings and everything. And there were butchered bodies laying on the floor of almost every room of this building. In total, six men were pronounced dead at the scene. They'd all been savagely murdered with their hands tied behind their back, their ankles tied together. A lot of them even had tape over their mouths. They'd all had their throats slit. Some of them more severe than others. Some of them just had like a bit of a slit on their throat. Others were almost completely decapitated. They'd all been doused in petrol, but it didn't seem as though the petrol had been set alight at any point, they'd just been covered in petrol and they'd all been shot in the back of the head execution style. But that's not even the extent of the horror that police found inside Sizzlers. There were also three more men that were clinging to life. They were still alive, but they were bleeding out. They were moaning, screaming in agony, crawling around the room, desperately trying to save themselves. And this is really graphic, but all three of these men had all the same injuries as the six men that were dead. So they'd all had their throats cut, they'd all been shot in the head, they all had their arms and their feet tied. And because they'd had their throats cut, police could hear them literally choking on their own blood. All three of these men that were still alive when police got there were all transported to hospital, as well as that guy that made it to the gas station. So four survivors were transported to the hospital. Sadly, only one of these four men survived. The other three succumbed to their injuries and now there were nine total victims of the Sizzlers massacre. These nine men included the owner of Sizzlers, 56-year-old Eric Otgar, the Massos, 22-year-old Sergio De Castro, 21-year-old Marius Mayer, 20-year-old Travis Reed, 29-year-old Timothy Boyd, 22-year-old Johan Mayer, 22-year-old Robert Visser, and the youngest of all the workers was 17-year-old Stefanus Fouch. Those were all the men that worked at Sizzlers, but there was also one client that lost his life that night too. 43 year old Gregory Berghaus, who was in the middle of an appointment when the massacre began. The only survivor of this attack was actually the man that managed to run to the gas station, the person that managed to report this whole thing. His name was Quinton Taylor. Let me remind you how badly injured this guy actually was. He had his throat slit, his whole jaw was kind of out of place and shattered. He was actually found to have two gunshot wounds to the head and he managed to survive this somehow, he had two bullets in his head. It was a miracle, it was an absolute miracle that this man survived. And he believes that the reason he survived was because of God. He said that at the time of the massacre, he wasn't even a religious person, but in his sheer desperation, he really thought he was gonna die. He turned to prayer because he felt like he needed that comfort. He said the only prayer that he remembered from his childhood was, if I die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. And he repeated 
that over and over and over and he believes that that is what saved his life. He believes that God saved him. Slightly skipping ahead here, but Quinton Taylor actually converted to Christianity after this massacre. He said that that proved to him that there is a God and that prayer works and that the universe can answer your prayers. Anyway, back to the timeline of events. So all of this happened in the early hours of the morning around like 3 a.m. And by 8 a.m. the following morning when everyone was going to work, the news began to break on radio stations and on the news. And outside Sizzlers, there was this huge growing memorial of flowers and letters, signs, pictures, everything. People bringing things for the victim, coming to pay their respects. The whole city was outraged and everyone felt this pain so personally. Like I said, this was the biggest massacre in Cape Town's history and police knew that they were gonna have to work hard to solve this. So the first clear theory that everyone initially believed in this case was that this was a hate crime. A gay massage parlor was particularly targeted here. Sizzlers was known to have a lot of gay clients and gay people themselves even worked there. So it made sense that that was the motivation behind this. Police were desperate to speak with Quinton Taylor about this whole thing because of course he witnessed it all and survived it. So he will have seen the killer's face. He would have understood why this was going on potentially, but his treatment was gonna take a long time for him to even be kind of stable enough to talk to the police. It's understandable considering his injuries. So for a while, police were gonna have to try and investigate this with without Quinton. So they spoke with everyone that they could, neighbors that lived around Sizzlers, they spoke with all the victims, friends, family, people in their lives. And they learned that a lot of the Sizzlers boys, which is what they were referred to, they were the Sizzlers boys, they didn't actually enjoy their jobs. I mean, it was very polarizing actually from what I could find in my research. Half of them hated their jobs and hated Sizzlers and half of them seemed to really love it. I think a lot of it came down to the men's reason for doing that job. I think half of them actually enjoyed their job and they applied to do that job because they wanted to do it. But then the other half of them just felt forced into it because they needed the money. And that's the sad reality of a lot of sex work is that a lot of people feel like they're forced into it because it's kind of easy money in a way that there's a demand there for it and every single person has the ability to sell it. A lot of the men that worked at Sizzlers were even straight. They weren't even interested in men. They weren't interested in having sex with men. They didn't enjoy it, but they needed that money. All of the men slept at Sizzlers as well. They had kind of like a dorm room situation. So I suppose accommodation was included in the job, which again is something that drew a lot of poorer people that were desperate for money and shelter to take this job even though they really didn't want it. And even still this accommodation was not good. I mean they all had bunk beds and think like one star hotel kind of quality. Most of the Sizzlers boys did drugs all day every day to kind of cope with this lifestyle and there were rumours that I found in my research that the men wouldn't be allowed to go to bed at the end of the night unless they fulfilled a kind of quota. So they would have to do like three or four or five classes in a day or they literally would not be able to go to bed. But these were just some of the reports. Other reports from certain workers that enjoyed their job said that their job was wonderful and they had a really great boss and the pay was really good. Some of them said that they would all just have a really fun time. It'd be like a boy's holiday and they'd all just like watch films and party and have a great time together. So I think it really comes down to each person's personal experience at Sizzlers as to whether they really enjoyed it or really hated the job. So that's what police found about Sizzlers in general, but more specific to the night of the massacre, they actually found that one of the victims, Robert Visser, was due to have a client at 2 a.m. that morning. They spoke with this client and the client said that they never actually ended up going to Sizzlers that night because they tried to contact Robert and they just couldn't get hold of it. They said they called Sizzlers, like the actual official phone number for Sizzlers. Someone picked up and all they could hear on the other end was breathing and then the person put the phone down. So they thought, right, okay, that's really weird. And then they ended up calling Robert Visser's like personal mobile number and it just went straight through to voicemail. So this client just thought that 
I don't know, that Robert had changed his mind, that he was ghosting him, so they never turned up for their appointment that night. After speaking with neighbours that lived close by to Sizzlers, they managed to identify a vehicle of interest and a group of people of interest as well. There was this white BMW car that was seen in the early hours of the morning that four men were seen jumping into and speeding off into the night. Now, because it was so dark, it was the middle of the night, the neighbours couldn't give a very accurate description of these men. There were certain things that they could say so one of the men was quite like big and burly and he had a tattoo of a snake on his upper arm that same man also had a beard his hair was kind of like a gingery blondy kind of color that's the best description they could give and then as for the other three men they could only say things like oh one guy was pale and he had dark hair another guy was thin you know, the descriptions weren't very good. So obviously this didn't give police too much to go on in the way of specific suspects, but it did tell them quite a bit more about the actual crime, that they were looking for a white BMW, maybe a group of four men, and that led them to their next theory, and that was maybe this was a gang-related killing. As I said, Seapoint had this really big issue with gangs and even gang related murders were relatively common in that area and this bore all the hallmarks of a gang related killing it was a raid it was in the middle of the night they used multiple different weapons victims were tied up gagged and a group of men was seen outside not just one man not even just two men a group so this was the new theory, that this was gang related. The old theory wasn't completely disregarded, that it was a hate crime because, well, I mean, there's always the possibility that it could be both. It could have been a gang related hate crime. But now police began looking into local gangs and that was when they found something very interesting. And that was that two former Sizzlers employees had had an argument with their management, with the, the guy that owned Sizzlers, left and then joined gangs. So this seemed like it could have been some sort of revenge killing, a revenge massacre. Maybe these two guys were so angry at how they'd been treated in Sizzlers, they didn't like how things ended, so they decided to get some revenge. I think this was later ruled out. I don't know if police managed to identify and speak with those specific guys, but they managed to speak to other Sizzlers employees who kind of told police, mm, that's not really how it went. I don't think they would want to commit a full massacre I don't think it was quite the explosive ending that would lead to something like that, you know? But after speaking with some of these Sizzlers employees and even former employees, this only led them down another rabbit hole. And that was when they heard rumors that the owner of Sizzlers, Eric, was into drug dealing. All his friends and family denied it, but a bunch of his former colleagues said that he did. So, I mean, maybe it was something that his friends and family weren't aware of. Maybe it was something that just happened within the walls of Sizzlers and then when he left there, he had nothing to do with it. But that also opens us up to a third motive and maybe that was that he just pissed off the wrong people within this, within these drug circles. Maybe he was in debt, maybe he owed someone some money and couldn't pay it back and so this was their form of revenge. So police were faced with this whole just web of different things, different motive, different suspects, different theories. It was hard for police to focus on just one thing and try and investigate just one thing at once. So it's kind of hard for me to report it that way. To avoid it getting too confusing, police were working on all these different things at once and eventually they managed to whittle it down to two suspects. But the problem is these two suspects weren't actually suspects, they were suspect sketches. So they didn't have names, they didn't have identities, they just had what they believed the two killers looked like. By the way, they believed at this point that it was two killers. I don't really know what happened to the four men in the white BMW theory, I don't know if it was disregarded, it was probably just disproved I suppose. So now police had these two sketches of the two people that they think are their suspects and they broadcast these sketches all over the news, all over every newspaper in the whole area asking people, do you know these men? Do you recognize these men? And by this point, Quinton Taylor had recovered in hospital and he was ready to be part of the investigation. So they brought these sketches to him and he said, yes, definitely, those are the two men that did this, that massacred all my friends. So police went back to the database and they looked up a bunch of people with previous criminal records in very similar things. So different people that had committed murder, different people that had committed armed robberies because they knew they owned guns, people that had firearms charges, things like that. And they showed all of these pictures to Quinton Taylor and one of them he recognized. So from Quinton Taylor and from the general public calling in after seeing these sketches, police 
finally had two names for their two suspects. The first of which was 27 year old Adam Verst. He was a restaurant manager in Seapoint. And the other was 48 year old Trevor Tears, who was a taxi driver, albeit an unofficial one, so a bit of a dodgy one. And he mainly, like his main clientele was prostitutes. So both of the men were arrested and taken back to the police station where they both exercised their right to silence. They both sat there and just said no comment to absolutely every question. So police went back and they printed off their criminal records. Their, they both had huge criminal records, did both these guys, Adam and Trevor. So police took these huge criminal records back into the interview room and presented them with them and they were like, look, we know you've got previous firearms charges, previous violence charges, just admit that you did this. And finally, the first of the two men to break was Trevor Tears. He told the police that this had actually been an armed robbery gone wrong. Trevor told the police that he and Adam had been friends for quite some time at this point. He actually met him when he was a regular at Adam's restaurant that he owned and eventually they just, they just ended up connecting. And the main basis of their friendship was criminal activity. I mean, both men really struggled with money. And so the two of them kind of bonded over this and they were like, right, well, let's do something about it. Let's just start going out and robbing people, robbing houses. So they were doing this for a while. And then one day Adam heard through the grapevine that at Sizzlers, they don't take the money to the bank. Like they don't put it away in a safe or anything. They just kind of have it laying about in the building. And those men make quite a decent amount of money. So he went and relayed this information to Trevor and he was like, look, this place would be brilliant for us to go and rob. Like there'll be so much just spare cash laying around. And so they decided that Sizzlers would be their next hit. Trevor managed to get hold of two guns while Adam's part of the plan was to call up Sizzlers and book an appointment. They were gonna pretend to be like genuine clients who were interested in actually soliciting these men's services. But as soon as they got there, their plan was to switch and just ambush the guys. But they wanted their confidence at first. They wanted the men to trust them. They wanted them to let them into Sizzlers without it being this big confrontation with guns out and stuff. So the two of them arrived, they got paired with this man and they all went to a private room where they were gonna do whatever. And that was when the attack began. They got their guns out and threatened this man to give them everything that he had on them. And he did, although he, just, he didn't really have much on him, they don't keep the cash just in their pockets. So he gave them whatever jewelry he had on. And of course this wasn't enough for the men. And so Adam and Trevor demanded that this guy take them downstairs to where the safe is. They wanted the big money. So this guy led them down to the company safe and unlocked it. And there Trevor and Adam found 3000 Rand. Now, if you're not familiar with South African currency, 3000 Rand is the equivalent of 150 Great British Pounds or $220 US dollars. Now this was not what the men wanted nor expected either. They heard that these guys at Sizzlers were making a lot of money and it was just laying around there in cash. This was not what they came here for. I think the men had been expecting to find like a million rand and they found 3,000 and this was enough to make Adam Verst snap. Trevor said that the plan had been to just go and rob the place and that was it. They were only taking guns to threaten them. They weren't going to use the guns. They weren't going to harm anyone. They were just going to maybe tie them up, steal all the money out of the safe and get out of there. But now Adam was furious and he turned to Trevor and he demanded that they slit everyone's throat that was in there, that was in this whole building. They kill everyone. Now, Trevor said that he very much disagreed with this at first. He was like, no, absolutely not. That's not what we've come here for. We only wanted money. We're not turning into murderers right now. But that was when Adam turned on him. Adam turned on Trevor and told him that if he didn't join in, if he didn't help him kill everyone in that massage parlor, then he would kill Trevor. So Trevor told the police that he reluctantly and under duress, out of fear for his own life, he joined in the massacre and he murdered nine, almost 10 people with Adam Verse. He said that Adam made the men all line up with their arms tied behind their back, their feet tied. He made them all line up on the ground and lay 
face down. Their agreed method of killing these men was to stab them once in the back of the neck because they were laid face down. And then from behind them, they would lift their head up and slit their throat and then put them back on the floor. And I think this is actually why Quinton Taylor survived this attack. And that was because he was the only one of these men that wasn't laid face down. He was actually laid on his back looking up. So he didn't get the stab in the back of the neck. He just got his throat slit. So how they did this was all the men were in a line. Trevor started at one side, Adam started at the other, and they just went down the line doing this to each of the men in turn like they were animals in a slaughterhouse. And once they were finished, it was clear that all the men at this point were still alive. They were still moaning in pain. And so Adam was like, we're gonna have to do something else. We're gonna have to do something more. And that was when the two men decided that they were gonna shoot each one of these men again in turn, starting at either side of the line, one at a time. I can't imagine the fear that you would feel being like one of the people in the middle of the line, just hearing this happen to all of your friends and you know that it's gonna be you any second now. So one thing that I read about Trevor quite a lot in this case, and I'm not sure if it's 100% true, but this is something that people say, and that is that he was one of the more compassionate of the two. It's not compassionate. He still murdered nine people. He still took part in this massacre but compassionate is the word that is used quite a lot. Trevor was supposedly going a lot easier on their victims than Adam was. Like with when they were cutting their throats, like I said, half of the victims were almost entirely decapitated. Now they were Adam's side of the line, but Trevor's side of the line, he was slitting their throats a little bit shallower. He was hoping, or so he says, he was hoping that they would survive these wounds and be able to be treated for them. Same with the gunshots. He was trying to either intentionally miss or maybe try and shoot them in a place that it wasn't gonna kill them instantly. Whereas Adam, almost completely decapitating the victims, shooting them directly in the back of the head, he's trying to kill them. So that is Trevor Tay's story. That's his version of events. And so police, went and confronted Adam with this and said, look, your mates confessed, you might as well confess. And that was when Adam told his version of events and it was almost the exact same as Trevor's, but the roles were reversed. So in Adam's version of events, it was Trevor that was the psycho killer that was forcing him to do all of this. And he was the one going easy on the victims. He was the one that didn't wanna do this. He was the one that was forced into it out of fear of his life. So now at this point, police have no idea what to believe. Who is telling the truth? Is one of them telling the truth and neither of them telling the truth? Are they doing this on purpose so that police can't figure out what happened. And that was when one police officer got the theory that maybe this was all a cover up for something much bigger than just these two men. What if these two men were hit men for someone else, like a bigger organized crime situation? After all, they had believed that this crime was gang related the whole time. So it makes sense that maybe Trevor and Adam were hired by someone and then this was just their kind of cover up story to make them seem the more innocent of the two killers. So that was a theory for a while. They tried to look into it. They tried to look if these two men were acting on behalf of these big gang bosses. For some reason, someone might want Sizzler's shut down, I don't know. Ultimately, there really wasn't any evidence to support this. It was just a theory in the middle somewhere. Another theory that kind of goes hand in hand with this is that maybe Adam and Trevor were hired not by gang bosses, but by a rival massage parlor. So the reason that this theory even exists is because of a threatening phone call that was made just two weeks before the massacre took place that essentially warned them that the massacre was gonna happen. So this is quite a confusing story, so I'm gonna try my best to explain this. Basically, there was a guy that lived close by Sizzlers who didn't work with them, but he had kind of ties to them. So he lived close by, he was friends with everyone there, he had ties with them. And he received a phone call two weeks before the massacre from someone believing that he owned Sizzlers. This call, I couldn't find exactly what was said, but essentially it was, watch your back or we're gonna kill you. And there was mention of like, close down Sizzlers, shut down Sizzlers. And then two weeks after this phone call, of course Sizzlers wasn't shut down. So maybe this person acted on that phone call and went and killed everyone at Sizzlers. So there's a few different things to discuss here. They called the wrong guy. 
did they know it was the wrong guy? Maybe they got the wrong number. Maybe they just thought the wrong guy owned it. Because like I say, he did live very close by. He had ties to everyone that worked at Sizzlers. So, I mean, it's possible, but all the reports that I've seen from this case say that it was pretty obvious that Eric owned Sizzlers. You know, that was quite a well-known fact in that area that he was the owner. So I don't know how easy it would be for them to mess that up and end up threatening the wrong guy and then carrying it out on a different guy. It's an odd one because there isn't much backing to it at all, but it is possible. And the guy that received that phone call genuinely believes it. Like that, he believes that 100%. Two days before the massacre, the same guy that received the threatening phone call got a phone call from Robert Visser, who was one of the Sizzlers boys, one of the victims. And he really wanted to speak to this guy. Robert said that he was worried about something. He really needed to urgently speak to this guy. And this guy said, oh, I'm not free at the moment. Moment, you know, I can talk in like two days time. And Robert was like, no, please come on, it's urgent. Like we really need to talk. But he never told them exactly what it was about. Anyway, this guy never found out what Robert Visser wanted to talk about because they never had that conversation. And then two days later, he was killed. And so was everyone else at Sizzlers. Could that have been what Robert Visser wanted to talk about? Could he have received a threat himself? But going back to the biggest theory in this case, and this is still the main believed theory years and years on, and that was that this was a hate crime against the LGBTQ plus community. Sizzlers was a known gay male escort service. Maybe Sizzlers was specifically targeted because the killers knew that everyone that worked there was either gay or bi or questioning or closeted, they all went there for one reason and one reason only. People just don't believe Trevor and Adam's stories, their version of events. What kind of robbery gone wrong ends in this fashion? This was an absolutely savage attack. They used multiple weapons, multiple methods of inflicting injuries. The systematic slaughter of each man one by one by slitting their throat and then shooting them in the back of the head, execution style, that is not a robbery gone wrong. It's all unnecessary. It's all overkill. It seemed as though the men were doing all of this just because they were enjoying inflicting pain and terror on their victims. A robbery gone wrong is supposed to be just that, a robbery that has not gone the way that it was intended. And usually when something goes wrong in the moment, a gun goes off, they shoot someone, hurt someone, kill someone, the assailants will normally flee the scene. They'll normally get the hell out of there because that wasn't their intentions. They didn't want to do that and so now they're scared. But not Adam and Trevor. They stayed at the scene and continued prolonging this attack out, doing all these different things to their victims. They took their time here as well. They, they they didn't have to shoot everyone. They'd already slit everyone's throat. They were already all gonna bleed out and die, but they wanted to go one step ahead. This crime just seemed like it had a lot of emotion, a lot of anger, a lot of energy behind it because they were doing all these different things. It just wasn't an accidental thing that happened in the moment. This wasn't a robbery gone wrong, in my opinion. And the theory is that that anger and those emotions and their, their desire to inflict all this pain and terror on these victims comes from homophobia, that this was a hate crime crime, that they targeted Sizzlers intentionally because they wanted to go and do this to a bunch of gay men. So police went and spoke with Adam's ex-wife because obviously she probably knows him better than anyone else on this planet. And they wanted to go and ask her how accurate this theory could be. And she says that that's not even a possibility. She said that Adam was a loving, kind, caring, accepting person. His brother, his own brother was gay and he'd always accepted and loved his brother exactly how he was. He didn't have a homophobic bone in his body. He would never do anything like this. And I mean, I have a few issues with what she said. So this is supposedly in her eyes a very kind, caring, loving man. But that kind, caring, loving man went on to massacre nine people. Whether they were gay or not, he murdered nine people. So maybe, just maybe, he's not the man that you think he is. Maybe. So yeah, sure, maybe she doesn't think that he is capable of murdering a load of men just for the exact reason that they're gay. But I think he's proven that he's not the man that she thinks he is anyway. So I think her opinion is out of the window here, maybe. As much as this theory is believed to this day that this was a hate crime, police at the time, as soon as they got these messy, conflicting stories, versions of events from both Adam and Trevor, they kind of disregarded the hate crime theory because they had two men admitting to an armed robbery gone wrong. So they were just like, okay, let's just, let's just do it. Let's just get them put away. And so for that reason, that is the official legal 
motive behind this crime, but this was an armed robbery that went wrong. And for that, they were both found guilty of all nine murders, one attempted murder of Quinton Taylor, possession of firearms, one of them was a stolen firearm as well, possession of ammunition, and of course, an armed robbery charge. For that, they were both sentenced to nine life sentences each, for their nine victims, plus 20 years each for the attempted murder of Quinton Taylor, plus an additional 15 years each for the armed robbery, another five years for the possession of the firearm and possession of ammunition, plus Trevor was given another three years on top of that because he actually stole one of the firearms that they used. So not only did they have nine life sentences, nine, life sentences, one after another, that, that's enough to put someone in prison for nine lives. But they also have an extra 53 years on top of that from all those additional charges. So you would think that that would be enough to keep these men in prison for the rest of their life, would you not? Wrong. Trevor Tears actually passed away in prison in 2008 from a heart attack, but Adam Verse, unbelievably, is actually eligible for parole right now. How? Due to his good behavior in prison, this man that massacred nine people, attempted to murder a 10th, is deemed eligible for parole to potentially be let out back onto the streets after murdering nine people and almost a 10th. His first parole hearing was actually in 2015, 16 kind of time. That's, that's as early as he was going to be allowed out. He wasn't granted parole, so he's still in prison right now, but I think his next parole hearing is gonna be kind of soon. We can only hope that he stays locked up after every single parole hearing. We can only hope that each one is denied and he just stays in prison for the rest of his life. If he does get out at his next parole hearing, which will be maybe this year or next, then that means that he will have served less than two years for each of the lives that he took that day, which is just an awful thought. I truly can't understand what's going on with South Africa's justice system there. I, c I do not see the logic behind that at all. I'll leave a petition down below for you to sign that Robert Visser's sister actually created. Of course, the families of the victims are well against this guy ever being released from prison. So if you can show your support through that link down below, please do. But that completes this case. Thank you so, so much for watching. I really hope you enjoyed the way that I tell these cases. Thanks again to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Remember the first 1000 of you guys that click the link down below in the description will get 30% off of an annual premium membership. Don't be late because there is only a thousand of those. Go click it. Go click it. Huge thank you to all of my channel members for helping me decide the cases that I cover, especially my tier two members whose names are all on screen right now. If you wanna become a channel member, you can just click the join button on a desktop or there'll be a link in the description of this video. But yeah, thank you so, so much for watching. If you enjoyed, please leave a thumbs up down below because that'd really help me out. If you wanna subscribe, there'll be a link to do so right here. If you wanna subscribe to my second channel, there'll be a link to do so right here. And if you wanna watch another true crime video, there'll be a playlist on screen right now. Bye.